I want to talk to you about priorities. There are good priorities, better priorities, and the best priority, and we want to get it right. Let's just say it straight out, right up front, that my relationship with God, the Father, through the saving work of Jesus Christ, empowered in my experience as our brother reminded us this morning, through the presence of God's Holy Spirit in my life. That is the best priority that I could possibly have. That is the best priority that you could possibly have. Now, this is not just your pastor telling you this, although I tell you that as often as God gives me breath to do it. These are the words of Jesus himself that Nancy read for us this morning in Luke chapter 14. And in this passage, I don't know how you felt as Nancy was reading it, if you were really paying attention, but but Jesus attacks, and that's the right word for it. There can be no other word for it. Jesus attacks some really great priorities in our lives. He, He never says that these are not good things for us in our lives, What we're going to learn this morning is they could just never take the place of the priority in our life. He tells us about this in the form of a parable about people and a wealthy man. This wealthy man prepares this great banquet, and he invites a lot of people to it. And what we read, what Jesus tells us, is that many people make excuses in their RSVP. Do you all know what RSVP means? I took French in high school. It's one of the few things I remember. I remember I took French because there was a pretty girl in in that French class. That's not a good reason to take a language. (laughs) I want you to know I really suffered through that class. But here is what RSVP stands for. Responde vous s'il vous plaît. All right, responde, RSVP, responde s'il vous plaît. That's it, okay? Responde, respond, si, if, vous, you, all, play, please. Respond if you please. Responde, es, respond, RSVP. You can see why I did not do so well in French. <laughs> but many make excuses in their RSVP about why they cannot attend. And through this parable and Jesus' teaching, which follows this parable, we learn about the issue of priorities. And priorities that may still be priorities in our life, but they can never be excuses that respond, keep us from responding to Jesus calling in our life. So we're going to look at five priorities that I'm going to just tell you flat out. These are good priorities. These are things that the Bible even tells us are are things that we should pursue. But Jesus says these are not the priority. And I'm going to reorder Jesus' teaching in just a little bit. All these are in the verses that we looked at this morning. But I'm going to reorder this just to kind of give you a life experience because these are kind of the order that we experience these priorities in, all right? So here are five priorities that cannot be excuses, all highly valued in Hebrew culture, all highly valued in the New Testament in the early Christian life, all still highly valued by us today and by you today. Why this teaching is so shocking to us. And here's the first priority that can never be an excuse, and that is our family. Family. We love family. The Bible tells us to love family. But here's what Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate, oh man, is that a strong word? If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, such a person cannot be my disciple. Yes, family is a priority. In fact, let's be just straight out about this and make this as confusing as we possibly can. Honoring our father and our mother is even the fifth commandment, right? And in fact, it's the first commandment with a promise. If you look in the, in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and your mother, why? So that you may live a long life or so that your life may go well, depending on which version you read. 
So is Jesus here saying if anyone does not hate his father and mother, is Jesus here contradicting one of the Ten Commandments? No. All right, so how do we put this together? Hate used as such a strong word in Jesus' teaching to show the relative priority of loving God more, which, by the way, in the Ten Commandments, that's the first and second commandment, right? It comes before honoring our, our father and our mother is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our might, right? And we see here this word hate. So what's Jesus doing? He is using something that he used a lot in his teaching. It's called hyperbole. All right, so wait a minute, Mark, hyperbole, there you go, using those big words again, hyperbole. That's when you use exaggerated speech to make a point. And here Jesus is using exaggerated speech to make a point. And let's just face it, he did this a lot. All right, I mean, you, you got to be a little bit mature in your faith when you read Jesus' teaching. He talks at one point about the camel having to go through the eye of a needle. Okay, that doesn't happen very often. That's hyperbole. He, he talks about making sure that your right hand knows what your left hand is doing. That's hyperbole. You know, I don't know about you, but it's kind of hard for me to hide my right hand from my left hand. He, he talks at another point that it is better for you to pluck your eye out than to lust after a woman. Please, you know, we don't want some one-eyed guys walking around here, okay? He's using hyperbole to show the importance of what he's talking about here, not to take anything away from his teaching. The point here is that your love for your family, as great as it must be, can never be at the same level or greater than your love for Christ. Or if it would be so, Jesus puts it very clearly here that you could not possibly be a true disciple of Christ. A priority that cannot be an excuse. Family. Here's another priority. Good priority, but not the best priority. Can never take the place of our number one priority, and that second priority is our work or our education. <coughs> Whoa. Pastor Mark, I don't see those words anywhere in this parable, work or education. Well, let's take a look at it. Verse 19. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. I bet you never connected the five yoke of oxen to your work or education before, have you? But here it is. What do five yoke of oxen have to do with priorities of work and education? Simply this. The yoke of oxen would be the means of work for a farmer. He can simply be a whole lot more productive if he's got those, those uh, five yoke of oxen. And let's also face the fact that at this time, the number one industry in Jesus' day and age was what? Agriculture. So anything, literally anything that we would do that would prepare us to be more effective, to be more efficient, to be able to work harder, to be better at what it is that we do, to earn a better living. That's a valuable priority to have in one's life. Lots of Proverbs in the Old Testament about working and working hard. Here's just one of them, Proverbs 12, 11. Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Did Jesus kind of conveniently forget to read this particular passage when he's talking about the one who goes off to see the five yoke of oxen? You see, to have the opportunity to purchase five yoke of oxen in that day and age, that would be a top priority in any farmer's life. And this, by the way, would not be something that would happen just every day. All right, This would be an exceptional thing. This would be like a once-in-a-lifetime kind of opportunity. So does Jesus not get it? Of course he gets it. And that's the very fact that he gets it is why he is trying to, again, give you the idea about what is not just a priority, but the priority in your life compared to responding to God's invitation to his ultimate banquet in our life. There are no excuses, even 
you know, the effort to get educated, the effort to prepare ourselves for work. Here's another priority that cannot be an excuse. It's going to blow some of you away because it's such a top priority. We emphasize it so much. The priority of marriage. Marriage. Now, you see, we're kind of, we're kind of growing our little sermon here, right? We start with family, and then we get into work and education, and, and now our little sermon is uh, ready to graduate from college and ready to get married, <laughs> right? Marriage, top priority. Still, another one says in verse 20, still another says, I just got married, so I can't come. Now, marriage is a big priority in both uh, Hebrew and the early Christian cultures, held to a very, very high standard. In Mosaic law, a man could even be excused from military service for the entire first year of his marriage. Could be a war going on, you get married, yeah, you don't have to play in the war today, all right? Because being married is more important. That's how high the priority is. You stay with your wife, you have a one year honeymoon, and then you can be in military service. Most of us would understand if we invited somebody to a banquet, we prepared a great meal, and we sent out an invitation, and we found out that one of our friends just got married, we probably wouldn't even send the invitation, right? We'd say, well, yeah, they can't come. They just got married. They're on their honeymoon. They're excused. But Jesus here says that in this case of the great feast of the kingdom of God, there can be no higher priority, hear me here, there can be no higher priority than responding, RSVP, with yes and now. Yes and now. No higher priority. Let's grow this sermon a little bit more. Let's, uh, let's get past the family part, past the work and education part, past the marriage part. Now, we're in our later years, and here's another priority that we see advertised a lot. Maybe I do, just because of my age. Investments and retirement. Big priority, right? We want to set aside money. We want to have uh, the ability to provide for our retirement. Here we come to the back half of verse 18. The first said, I have just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another excuse given is the opportunity for investment. Now, this sounds an awful lot like, you might think that Jesus is repeating himself here. You might say, this sounds an awful lot like buying the five oxen. But in this case, it's really different. Because here, he's buying property. This is an investment. This might be the culmination of someone's work in that day and age. It may be property that he himself is going to work, but you know what else is also possible? When you buy property, when you own agricultural land, you can hire other people to work it for you. You can rent out the land. In other words, this is the culmination of a lifetime. And to be a landowner in that day and age is also a social station in life. One who owned land, had achieved something that may have taken a lifetime of work. Today, this would be the equivalent of a lifetime of savings, what we might call our 401k or our IRA or our pension plan today. And we can see even in our day and age today, politically, how important this is. There's a political saying that's been around for most of my adult life in our generation that social security is called the third rail of politics. Have you heard that? So what in the world is the third rail of politics? Well, it goes back to uh, railroad days when there was rail one, rail one, and then two, and then there was a rail three. And rail three was where the electric current went through. And you touch that third rail, you die. Okay? And so the idea politically today is don't mess with Social Security. Don't mess with people's retirement. Or if you're a politician, you die. Okay? We still have that priority in our life. And so in that day, people would understand if someone needed to go and see a field that he had just bought. This wasn't something that, you know, we, we, we think of some rich guy who does this all the time. This would be the end result of somebody's lifetime of work, a worthy priority instead of attending somebody's feast. But not 
when it comes to responding to God's RSVP. Do you see the important thing that Jesus is saying here? So let's grow this sermon up a little bit more, right? We got, the, we got the family part of the sermon when our sermon was just a little baby, and then our sermon got old enough to get, uh, go to school and get an education, and then our sermon got married, and then our sermon you know, saved a little bit of money and had investments in retirement. And now we come to the ultimate priority that we see in our sermon, that we see in our life itself, priority number five that's so important to us, and Jesus says isn't more important than your RSVP to him, and that is my very life itself. My very life itself. After going through each stage of life, family, work and education, marriage, investments in retirement. Jesus comes to what is considered for almost every one of us still today the very greatest priority of most people, our very existence, life itself. What is it that Jesus says in verse 26? If anyone comes to me and does not hate, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Now, admittedly, these are all exaggerations on purpose in Jesus' storytelling. Each one of these priorities is God-ordained and provided for in very strong terms in God's Word. So we must look at what is the story behind the story. What is it that Jesus is telling us What is the point that Jesus is making? And it's simply this, that our RSVP to God, our responde s'il vous plaît to God is not an exaggeration. It's not a good choice. It's not a better choice. It is the choice. It is the best choice. It is always the top priority. And that brings us to our next fill-in here. That my invitation, your invitation for relationship with Christ takes priority over everything else. Say, what did, what did I learn when I went to Church Recall today? It's simply this. My invitation for relationship with Christ, my response to that invitation takes priority over everything else. Verse 16 and 17, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent a servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Important you read that last sentence correctly with the right emphasis on the right words. Come, for everything is now ready. Ready. This is the perfect description of the invitation that God extends to you and extends to me for us to have this relationship with him. Come, come. Don't hold back. Don't say no. Don't do anything else. Don't let something or anything ever keep you from responding yes to God's invitation to you when he extends it. And now, for everything is now ready. Do you see that? There's an important reason why the now is included here. Because the timing is always important. When God invites you, it's never usually at our convenience. It's not usually when we would say yes. It's not usually what we are thinking about. It normally is right in the middle, oftentimes, of the most difficult moments in our life that we have the opportunity to hear God speak to us. But there's no rain check here. When God talks to you, there there can be no other priority, no matter how important it is, there can be no other priority in your life when God calls and God invites. It's always come, for everything is now ready. So if God is calling you, either into a relationship with him or for any other reason, for any other purpose, my question would be simply this, what are you waiting for? What is it that keeps you from responding yes and now to God's RSVP? 
You want to know how to make sure that you RSVP the right way? Let's wrap up our sermon today with just a little acrostic that I hope throughout this week you'll be able to remember RSVP. I don't expect you to remember the responde, s'il vous plaît, okay, French thing. I still can't remember it. But here's an RSVP that I think you can remember. You want to respond to Jesus correctly, to his invitation. Here's how you do it. Four things. R-S-V-P. Here's the first one. R. Respond. Ha! That was not hard. Respond. Yes, respond to Jesus' invitation. The first thing, the most obvious thing, is to respond. To say yes and to say yes now. Jesus describes this invitation into relationship when we get to the very last chapter, the end of the book, Revelation chapter 3, he describes it as if he is standing at the door of your heart and knocking and asking to be let in. Here's what he says. Be earnest and repent. We often skip that first part, but this is important. Be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, with that person, and they with me. Why does he talk about coming in and eating? Because that's when you have the most social, close time with a friend. This past Friday night, uh, Mary Kay and I invited some friends over for dinner. And I went shopping at 2 o'clock, came home at 3 o'clock. I started prepping the food at 3, and they were supposed to be there at 6, and thank God they were late by about 10 or 12 minutes because I didn't have it ready. But 12 after, they walked in, and it looked like we hadn't done anything. Everything was just all ready to go. The hot food was in the, was in the oven, and the cold food was in the refrigerator and the freezer, and we just had us a feast. And it was a blessing. And it was an opportunity for relationship. This is the picture that Jesus presents to you, that he wants a relationship with you. He doesn't want a high by. He doesn't want a here we are today, tomorrow we're gone. It's an ongoing, let's sit down and let's eat together. Let's talk about the day. Let's talk about what's going on in your life. Let me be your very best friend. If you hear God speak to you, if you feel God speak to you, if you're aware of of Jesus asking you for relationship in your life, don't ever fight it. Don't ever put it off. He wants what's best for you, and he knows you better than you know yourself. He wants to be with you, to help you, to love you. He wants relationship. We say all the time that Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. When you really understand what Christ is all about. It's about relationship. And this great banquet, this feast that Jesus is talking about in this kingdom of God in his parable, always, always, always begins with a more intimate meal with Jesus. But it's never, ever Jesus plus. We struggle with this. We want Jesus and our family. We want Jesus and my education and my preparation. We want Jesus and my wife. Jesus and my husband. Jesus and my investments. Jesus and my retirement. Jesus and my life. No, no, it's always only ever Jesus only. And when we respond, that's how we have to respond as he is the priority in our life. That's why you have this Earnest and repent at the beginning. Be earnest and repent. So if you have not come to that place in your life where you have not earnestly repented and started this relationship with Christ, boy, today would be the best day ever to get that started. Why not do it now? Why not do it here today? You could always remember the spring forward Sunday. You can always say, I just didn't get enough sleep. But, you know, I responded today. But, you know, I know most of us here have done that. So I've given you an SVP, all right? There's an R, we've got to respond, 
but there's also an SVP. And for those of us who have already responded, who would say, yeah, I'm already a Christ follower. I've already done that. Here's the SVP for you to remember how to keep on responding, how to keep on having your heart soft to him. Here's the S. Start each day with Christ. Start each day with Christ. It's important that we see every single new day that we get as a new gift from God, as an opportunity from God to serve him, as an opportunity from God to praise him, as an opportunity from God to be able to give him glory. But can we just be honest with each other? Most of the time, we wake up in the morning, and we're late, and we're rushing, and we've got to get out the door on time. We've got things that we've got to do. And that rushing feeling overwhelms us. And so we just don't give that much time to our thought with Christ's relationship. So we start the day off wrong. And we think maybe later on we can get caught up. And you just know the truth of it. You would never do. Because by the time you get home that night, you're exhausted. You're tired. The psalmist puts it this way, 143.8. Let the morning bring me... Word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I entrust my life. Boy, that is a that is a verse that if you could memorize, and that could be on your lips when you wake up first thing in the morning. The morning then would become your opportunity to to recall just how much Jesus loves you, how much you can trust him, how much you can count on him for him to give you direction for your day, for you to ask him for guidance. By the way, he knows what's coming around the corner. You don't. Literally, every single day, we could start with trusting our very lives to him. R, respond. S, start every single day. Here's the V, visualize visualize my life beyond the here and now. Visualize. you got to spend a little bit of effort here thinking through what life looks like that is life eternal. Because we are eternal beings wrapped up in this temporary shell. (laughs) Living our day-to-day lives, and it seems like, you know, we're just here for a little bit. Why are we eternal? Have you ever thought about this? What is it that makes you eternal? Some people think that we're all just eternal because that's who we are, that we are. But it's not true. There's only one eternal being. It's the eternal one with a capital O who is also the most all-powerful one. And he deems it should be so that you should be eternal, not us. Without God's eternity, without God's power, what is it that we are? We see this in James and also in Psalms. What is your life? You are, here's here's what you are. You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Or here's the psalmist version, but now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you, right? My eternity, your eternity comes from God. And without him, we have no eternity. And so if you don't stop regularly and intentionally think and visualize what your life really is, here's what you will do. And here's what many of us do do. We major on the minors. We focus our life and stress out over things that are here today, gone tomorrow, when really, because of God's love and power in our lives, we are eternal beings. We make a big deal out of the unimportant. And as a result, we miss out on the opportunities for the eternal, for the eternal things in our lives, the eternal things that really matter. But when we visualize our life beyond the here and now, when you really stop and think about it, that's one good reason to come to church on Sunday morning. It's another really great reason to start every single morning with Christ, to be able to visualize your life beyond the here and now. Because when you refocus your attention on the eternal things in our life, what would that be? That would be God, God's word. Other eternal beings, other children of God, right? When we focus our lives on the eternal, then we focus on the important. We have the right priorities. So respond. Start every day. Visualize your eternal life. And then finally, the P, prioritize Christ in everything you do. 
Prioritize Christ in everything you do. We've got to understand that Jesus never said that family and education and work and marriage and investments and retirement, our health, our very lives, he never said that these things were not priorities. He simply said they can never be the priority. They cannot be the top priority. Let's put God's top commandment together with Jesus' instruction. All right, I'm going to take these two and put them together and see if they don't make sense to you. Okay, this is Exodus 23. 20 verse, uh, chapter 20, verse 3, where we get the, the commandment. And then I'm going to put it together with Matthew 6, which Jesus tells us how to live it out. Here we go. You shall have no other gods before me. That's number one commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. What does Jesus say this? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added to you as well. See, when... We seek God and God's kingdom and God's priorities, God's righteousness first. All of these other priorities fall into place. In fact, it's really the only way that we can actually work out these other priorities in our life. Without God in first place, without us following his righteousness, you just know it. I don't have to tell you. I don't have to preach to you. You just know this. You're going to screw it up. <laughs> we, we have the tendency to mess up those other priorities. We don't even live up to our own expectations of ourselves, right? Let alone God's expectations of us. That's why Jesus promises this and all these other things. Seek God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. In other words, get the first priority right first, and everything else falls into place. So how do we do this? How do we prioritize Christ in everything we do? Well, we take these other priorities that are good priorities that the Bible tells us about, and we invest it with God and his righteousness. So let's go back through this list as this little sermon grew up and matured, and now it's almost ready to pass on into your life for the rest of this week, all right? How about family? Family. Well, let's love my family. You love your family by following God's rules for family life, by inviting him into my family, by worshiping together as a family, by making God the top priority of our family. And every single other one here is the same. It works out the same way. Education. Well, there is no education without God at the center. God is the reason for the education. There is nothing that we could learn that God would not be at the center of. And so if we ever find ourselves trying to learn something that doesn't have God in the middle of it, we need to reprioritize things, right? Because God and education just go together. How about work? Do you know there can be no good work without God as a partner to you in your life? So, you know, God's the one who gives us the strength. God's the one who gives us the ability to work. God's the one who gives us the mind that we can think through the things that we have to say, that we have to do. So we thank God. We invite God at the beginning of every work day. Help me to work today. Whatever it is that you do, let me do it in his strength and to his glory and to his praise. Marriage. <laughs> Christ is the center of our marriage. There's my husband and my wife, and there's Christ right in the center. And the whole point of our marriage is to uplift him. And that, you know, if I'm a husband, I, who, how do I love my wife? I love my wife as who? Christ loves the church. <laughs> and if I'm a wife, how do, I, how do I love my husband? I love my husband as I want to serve in the church. I want to serve my husband. Do you see? following the rules for marriage, making the priority of one and each other and never ever seeking anyone outside of that relationship, seeking God first. How about investments? <laughs> do, you, do you believe this or not? You can make investments with God in mind. You can, and you should. There shouldn't be like two different things. There shouldn't be like, okay, well, I have my investment life and I have my God life. No, you invest According to, if I'm putting my money here, does this honor God? Do I see things that are coming out of my investment that can be pleasing to him? In my retirement, you know, our, our idea of retirement is so twisted. 
We do not retire so that we can play more golf. We do not retire so that we can quit. We retire so that we can invest our life more heavily into ministry. Because there's going to come a day when we're going to be in heaven, and guess what? You're not going to be retired in heaven. Do you think you're going to be playing a harp on a cloud somewhere? No. God's got work for you to do. Work that you love, work that you can't wait to get to. Let's not wait to heaven to get there. Let's start it now. If I'm retired, I've got more time for that. Health. (laughs) Why am I focused on health? Because this is for now the physical temple of the Holy Spirit. It's like the church for God. This is where he dwells, and I want to do the very best I can with the building that he has given me. It's temporary. It's only for now, but I honor the body that God has given me. Do you see? I, every single priority in my life, even my life, <laughs> every day is a gift wrapped up for God himself. How about you today?